So I just wanted to give you a bit of an intro to um, a topic that we're going to cover um, actually for the next two papers. Um, something that's been uh, talked about a lot, but I have never had the chance to really look at it from a research point of view, so I thought we would um, read a little bit about this idea of the gut-brain axis. Um, and what this really means is that they're finding that our gut microbiota, so all the organisms that live in um, our GI tract, actually affect our brain. Um, you can see some examples over here. Um, we're looking actually at depression, anxiety um, in this paper, but um, the gut micro, um, yeah, the gut microbiome can influence your risk for different diseases. Um, they actually have found that um, the gut whoa, microbiome, oh dear, can um, produce, uh, um, sorry, my head, cholesterol, types of cholesterol that they think is actually causing um, clogging of the arteries. So it may not be from the food you eat, but the bacteria that colonizes your gut. Um, lots of different um, mood, um, the feelings of pain. Um, autism link is pretty um, interesting. And there's multiple sclerosis again. So lots of research being done on this communication um, between the gut brain axis. And one of the things I thought was really interesting is I had no idea that our gut microbes can actually produce neurotransmitters, which then makes sense as to how it might be regulating um, moods or our mental function. Um, and our brain talks to the gut. Um, you can see hormones being produced. You know that it um, is important in the immune system because we just read about the hygiene hypothesis. Um, so I think it's a pretty cool topic, and so we're going to wrap up this semester looking at the gut-brain axis and our gut microbiome um, influence. So until we got into this paper, I actually always thought or had always heard of this sterile womb hypothesis that says babies are basically sterile, um, and they're born sterile, but then as soon as they... Um, pass through the birth canal, into the air, all of that, they start to get colonized um, by different microorganisms. Now, we've talked about um, way back at the beginning of the semester that there are microorganisms that can cross the placental barrier. So then I thought, well, why did I think they're totally sterile? But anyways, this um, idea of when you are colonized with your microorganisms, and this is not just the gut bacteria, right? It's on your skin, um, all those areas that we talked about having your um, natural flora um, get colonized. But there are some interesting um, studies about um, the colonization of newborn. And, um, and this article talks about it's not just humans, but actually They've been studying this in insects for years, which I had no idea. Um, it's it's an interesting, it's a massive paper, but it's pretty interesting. Um, but there's differences in babies that are born vaginally versus C-section and babies that are breastfed versus um, bottle fed. And you can think about all these different um, contact sites that a newborn is going to come into um, sorry, contact with um, as they're born, and then all the people that come and visit the baby and um, all of that kind of stuff just starts to um, influence what's going to be your natural flora. And that differs where you live. Um, it differs, they talk about how many siblings you have, you know, how your parents raise you. Um, but what I think is most interesting is that this can contribute to your mental health. Um, 
So in this paper, I just wanted to define a few terms. So the paper that we're talking about is not on people, it's on mice. Um, and they're using two types of mice. They're using germ-free mice and they're using specific pathogen-free mice. So let me give you a little bit of information. So germ-free is just like it says. These should be free of all microorganisms. So these mice are raised. Um, you can see this um, incubator container. There's the little cages inside that you may have seen mice in before. The only way to do anything is through these um, gloved hands. So researchers never come in physical contact um, with the mice. And they're kept in these um, germ-free incubators. So axenic, I think that's how you say it, um, means germ-free. These little mice are actually born by C-section um, and there are no living microorganisms that can be cultured from these mice, right? So you can't grow up um, any bacteria from them. They don't have viruses. They don't have protozoa or fungi. Another term that's used in this paper is notobiotic, and that means they're known, it is known, um, what is colonized, or I'm going to put known inoculation. So in this paper, they're going to take germ-free mice, and then they're going to actually um, give them uh, microbiome, microbiota from um, humans, and so they are um, controlled inoculation. So we know, kind of, we kind of know <laughs> what they're giving. But you could, in theory, take a germ-free mouse and give it just E. coli or give it just staph or give it a virus, and that would now be notobiotic because you have controlled or you know what um, these mice have. Okay. So there are several sources that you can buy these germ-free mice. Um, most places, if they're going to do that work, um, or will actually breed their own um, to eliminate you know, any possible contamination. The other kind of mice that they talk about in this paper is specific pathogen-free mice. And all that means, and if you look, if you click on this link, you'll see a list. Um, it just means that it's pathogen, so disease-causing organisms have not infected um, these mice. So they have a gut microbiome. Um, if you start reading about specific pathogen free, the definition depends on who you um, buy them from. So it's not standardized, but like the Jackson Labs um, that are a huge uh, provider of um, mice for research, you can click on it and it will list all the pathogens that these animals do not have. And what they do is um, you take uh, serum blood and you test for antibodies to make sure that the mouse hasn't been infected or exposed um, to these different pathogens. Um, the cunning mice, I couldn't find much about them at all except, I'm just going to grab my paper, it was a really weird kind of place that I found it and it just says the Kunming kun, kun mice are the most widely used outbred colony in China. Um, differences in biological characters and drug reactions among different populations have been observed when using these mice. So outbred means um, they're not clones, they're not um, purebred, so they have some genetic diversity, which is usually good for studies. Um, it helps you... Uh, 
you know, have more variables, which I know it sounds like you don't want that in research, but if you're going to try to translate this to human studies, um, we all have differences in our genetics. So um, these mice are specific pathogen free, um, and again, um, a breed that's widely used in China where this study took place. So the idea is they're trying to look at the connection between your gut microbiome and in this case, um, um, mental health. Right? So they're looking at um, major depressive disorder, MDD, and so they're gonna have these germ-free mice that they can change the microbiome of and see their behavior and your specific pathogen free mice are your control. And they do a couple different tests. We've talked about these um, previously, but I just wanna help you understand what they're looking for. So the open field test, remember, <coughs> the mouse is put in this container and it gets to move around. And, um, and a, a mouse that has decreased anxiety or depression will have increased exploration. And so the way they're measuring this is they're taking the box and they're saying, okay, how long, first of all, how much does it move around? And then how long does it stay in this 25% um, central region? Okay, so if a mouse stays in there a long time, it might be scared, it might be depressed, it might be anxious, and it's not going to keep going out and exploring. So you want this number to be low, right, to show that there's no anxiety. So you want a lots of exploration. The Y maze, I'm not exactly sure why they use this. This is really a testing of memory. And what they score is alternation. So you start a mouse in one of these, and it can go around and explore and explore and explore. And they say that as you have less alternation, it means you have, sorry, more memory. So instead of go, keep going and exploring, 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 you're just like, yeah, I'm bored. Let's just hang out here. Maybe bored is not a good term, but um, it doesn't, everything that I found, this doesn't really relate to anxiety or depression, so I'm not exactly sure why they use this test, but that's what you're looking for. A decrease in alternation means you have increased in memory. So I guess they were just trying to show, yeah, these guys don't have any issues with their memory. The forced swim test um, looks just like this. You put the mouse in this water that they can't touch the bottom. And climbing, moving around a lot is good. Means you're healthy, like the mouse wants to get out of there. Immobility, as you increase the immobility where the mouse is just kind of floating or just keeping its head above the water, not trying to like climb out. Increased immobility is associated um, Sorry, increased immobility is associated with increased depression. So they talk about like the mice just kind of give up. So what you want to be healthy, healthy is de decreased, sorry, immobility, right? So same thing over here, tail suspension, the poor little mice are hung by their tail um, this is trying to show bars. This is how they measure it. So if you're trying to escape, this again means you're healthy. The more immobility, the more the mouse is depressed or anxious or stressed, right? The mouse is just like given up. So those are some of the tests that they're using to measure um, behavior. Once they see that um, by transferring 
microbiota from depressed and um, non-depressed people actually affects the mouse's, um, these germ-free mice's um, activity in these different tests, then they want to say, okay, what is in that microbiome? So hopefully you remember 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing from microbiology. Um, this is the common method to identify phylogeny, classification, figuring out what microbes are there, at least what kind of groups. Um, they're going to talk about OTU, which is Operational Taxonomic Units. which just really means what kind of sequence does, did we get. So you're going to get clusters of sequences that represent different phylogeny um, of bacteria. And so please, please, please don't get bogged down in all this um, sequencing jargon. Um, and when we talk about in just a second um, the metagenomics and the metabolomics, um, honestly, if I understood how they did all of this, I would explain it to you, but um, I know what they're looking for, okay? So 16 RNS is to identify types of bacteria, and you can get some relative abundance. So who's there more or there less? Um, based on how many times you get um, sequence information. So that can say, okay, these are the type of, these are the phyla of microbes, bacteria that we're seeing in the sample. Um, we can kind of get community information. Then they go on to do metagenomics and metabolomics. Okay, so this is telling you who is there and again, more at the phyla level when you're looking at whole communities. And if you remember King Philip Chase's old fat Girl Scouts, genus, species, family order, so phyla is way up here um, in the classification system. Then they look at metagenomics. So this is like asking what genes are in the community. So funny, when I use this computer in class, it never does this. I don't know what it what it is. So what genes are there? Okay, so say we know that there's this, the fib Fibdio, I never can say that kind, um, group. So what kind of genes are they containing? What are they encoding for? Um, so this is more than identification of who, this is an identification of their specific characteristics. So what kind of metabolism um, do they have? You know, what, what kind of um, proteins can they express? And then the metabolome is actually um, measuring, this is so frustrating, the byproducts um, of the community. So what are they actually, what, what genes are being turned on? What are they expressing? Um, so the metabolome can change based on the environment. Just like in your cells, right, all your cells have the same genetic information, but your skin cells express different genes than your muscle cells or your brain cells. And so they're not doing transcriptome, which is the actual RNA, what's being expressed, but in fact, the byproduct. So think of this as what is this microbiome community producing? And these are things that could eventually um, affect that gut brain access, right? Are they producing a neurotransmitter? Are they producing fats? Are they producing carbohydrates? So that's what this paper is looking at is first of all, does your gut microbiome 
affect your behavior? And if so, who is affecting it? What kind of genes do these organisms have and what are they actually producing? Um, I think that's, oh, and one more slide. Um, and the way they did this is a fecal microbiota transplantation, um, which is really, I think, so cool. I mean, it, it looks kind of gross, um, and I like how your poo could save a life. But basically it's saying, okay, we're going to take your gut microbial community and we're going to give it to someone else. Now for the mice, we're taking germ-free mice and we're giving them the fecal matter from um, a depressed person or a healthy control. But this has actually been used um, in humans and it's a way to help people maybe get over Crohn's disease or ir irritable bowel syndrome. So you take the microbiome from a healthy person from their gut and you give it to this person who has disease, hoping that those bacteria will colonize and um, prevent, change, eliminate, you know, um, decrease the disease symptoms. Uh, so yeah, it kind of sounds, looks kind of gross, but it's, I think, really cool. And because we don't know, you need, you know, 20 E. coli and 30 Bifibio and 10 Lactobacillus, we don't know that. It's easier just to take this good microbiome that's already been established and give it to someone else. So.